an amen is appropriate. Yes. And may God add a blessing to the reading and to the hearing and receiving and living out of God's word among the people of God here this morning. Amen. Um, I was inspired by David's creative greeting this morning, and I couldn't help but think, gosh, what would it look like to do a sermon like that? Not that I will do that this morning, and I thought it would look rather like those Mad Libs. (laughs) Remember that we used to do as children? Yeah, fill in the adjective, noun. It would be an interesting experiment, but not while, um, as I'm going to introduce to you, my district superintendent is in the congregation (laughs) this morning. Friends, this is Reverend Vivian McCarthy. She is the district superintendent for the Central Maryland District of the Baltimore-Washington Conference of the United Methodist Church. She is a guide and a team leader for other guides and coaches. Um, who support many different uh, churches in this area. She uh, works directly with Pastor Matt in our congregation, indirectly uh, with Jen and I, and with many of you who are church leaders. And I think you'd like to give us a word this morning. I would. Actually, I have preached that way. Not Mad Libs, you, although oh, I love Mad Libs. Okay. But the, it's really interesting. David, I was, I was a little uh, relieved when there were really answers. Because when you preach like that, usually what you get is... <laughs> people don't know what to say, even when the answer is Jesus. So <laughs> I'm really glad to be with you this morning. It's always a joy to worship with you at, at Glenmar. And to be here for three baptisms, that's pretty cool. But... Mm. I want to say two things. First of all, I want to tell you that I bring greetings from Bishop Scholl. And I want to tell you that he always is asking about the health and the, the spiritual growth of our congregations. And I'm happy to be able to report when things are going well. Second thing I want to say this morning is that I count it a huge privilege to get to work with the leadership here at Glenmar. And I want to make it really clear that I'm talking, I love the pastors, okay, but I'm really talking right now about the lay leadership. I have deep respect for the men and women that help guide this congregation because they take such good care of the business of this church. That is not always the case but I can always rely on the lay leadership at Glenmar to do the things that are needed to be certain that this church is healthy and whole and is doing what needs to be done Mm -hmm. to um, care for all of your resources, human, financial, and all those other resources that are necessary Mm -hmm. to be a church. So I wanted you to know that I feel blessed to get to work with this team. Blessings on you. Amen. You You will feel free to um, speak to Reverend McCarthy uh, after our worship service in the gathering place. You'll speak well of your pastors and we'll square up later, right? As I told the (laughs) choir. Church, I'm here this morning to talk to you about a church word, fellowship, and what it means. And our message today is titled, that Fellowship is More Than a Good Cup of Coffee. I don't know about you all, but I have been a joiner all of my life. From childhood, I was involved in scouts, sports in the community, the student government association of my high school, community associations, professional organizations, parent groups, women's groups, the PTA, the booster club, you get it, right? Are you tired yet? (laughs) I was after a while. Um, I was connected. I was networked. I was known. And this act of involvement extended into the life of my church also growing up. And in church, I was involved in the choir, in handbells. I was part of potluck suppers and bazaars and food and clothing drives, Christmas plays and Easter pageants. And so I thought I knew 
what fellowship was from the church. It's a church word. And I realized that growing up, fellowship was, at one time, a place. The fellowship hall, as if that's where it took place, right? Where people met, congregated, gathered, talked, drank some coffee, lemonade, had a meal together, that kind of thing. Then in another church, of which I belonged, uh, the fellowship became uh, a time, a time of fellowship, the fellowship hour, as if fellowship were a place and a time in my life. And now I realize if there are those of you who've been coming to Glenmar for a little while, you realize that fellowship is neither a hall nor an hour. It takes place in a big open space here outside the Spirit Center. And I think we have about 14 minutes over coffee and lemonade together um, to talk and get to know each other and then maybe um, try to part the sea of people who are shorter than us reaching for donut holes and all of that in our midst. Well, my experience of fellowship in the churches um, of my childhood carried me through for a while, but I'm here to tell you that fellowship is more than a good cup of coffee. See, at a point in my life, I went to live overseas. I lived in Japan for five years on a U.S. Air Force base. And in that community, where I didn't know anyone, someone invited me to church. Now, this church was involved in worship and suppers and service projects. But these folks also sat around with me, and they talked about God. They talked about the love of Jesus Christ and the things that God was doing in their lives. And a strange thing happened. Even though I was from the outside, new to the community, I didn't know much about anyone else or their background, they invited me to their homes, fed me, came to visit when my child was born, and they even, as I found out later, had been praying for me. Even though I had not been part of the community, they treated me as part of their community even before I felt like I was connected to them. And at that time, fellowship became more than just a place more than just a time, it became an experience of connection and community with others who knew Jesus Christ, an experience of Christ-centered living. These were folks who didn't know me and wanted something good for me. They were patient and generous and open. They welcomed me in a way that no one else in that community had. In short, they showed me Christian love. And as a result of that experience, I would say that my understanding of Christian fellowship moved the 18 inches from my head to my heart. And at that time, then returning home to the United States, I had a yearning, a desire, a hunger for Christ-centered living and a Christ-centered community. And so I went looking. I went church shopping, for one. Uh, yes, your pastor did. Try out lots of different churches. And I thought I actually found Christian community one summer reconnecting with a childhood friend. And at a barbecue event in her neighborhood, her next-door neighbor invited me to come to their weekly book club. They were studying a, a book that was faith-based, Christian background, and I thought, well, this sounds great. So my life was really busy and full, and I was um, preparing to meet with this group and found that as the day approached, I had not done the required reading. So I called up my friend and said, you know, your neighbor invited me to this group, but I feel a little bad about coming because I haven't completed all the reading um, for the book. And my friend said, Oh, Mary, that's okay. I'm really glad that you called because I wanted to talk to you about this. She said, um, I think there's something you need to understand. She said, we call this a book club, but it's actually a reason to get out of the house once a week away from our families and drink a little wine. <laughs> 
So I said, well, um, that's great. How does this work then? And she said, well, someone in the group's always done the required reading. So they summarize the chapters for the rest of us in case our spouse or families give us a pop quiz when we get home. I did not realize at that time that book club was a code word for something else. Um, and I will tell you, it was not a book club of Glenmar Church. <laughs> um, at that time, I told my friend, thanks very much, but I really was looking for an actual <laughs> book club and community. And so I'm sure they're having a great time um, without me. Uh, at this time, I was also visiting a local church, and I'd been a few times and started to feel kind of comfortable. And then one Sunday, the senior pastor gave sort of a challenge to us spiritually in the form of a question. And this is what he asked. What is your experience of Jesus Christ that the world needs to know? And it was like a light bulb went off. And I thought, that's it. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a community where people who have a shared experience of Jesus Christ are willing to talk about it together, to live life out of that. And friends, that's exactly what the author of First John, our reading today, is talking about. It's exactly what he's describing when he says, we declare to you what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. We declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and revealed to us. We declare to you what we've seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This was a community of people who both wanted to talk and share about the life of Jesus Christ and welcome others into it also. It was a life that was different from the life of social causes and social events and social networks. Different from the life of all of those things that we know today. And so it was living with Christ and each other as believers together. And the fullness of life that was experienced is described as joy that is complete. I've been together with a lot of people most of my life. We all have areas of our lives where we're together with other people. Amen? Aren't we in our communities, in our workplaces, in our civic organizations? And arguably, we're more connected than ever, right? We're texting, we're following, we're chatting, we're emailing, occasionally phoning, <laughs> and maybe more rarely talking face-to-face. -face. But some of those experiences are not exactly what we're looking for. Some of you are here today coming to church feeling like you want something more, more than being part of the membership. As our scripture says, you desire to be part of a fellowship. Some of us here would like to be more uh, than, than an address label on the church newsletter or an email address or a monthly electronic fund transfer from our accounts. Because those things are not what make us part of the church community. Our fellowship together means that we worship and we grow and we serve together. And we're in relationship with each other because of our relationship to Jesus Christ. We are rooted in his life-giving message. And so our scripture today from the author of 1 John suggests that we need to know something about that and be willing to share it with each other. And so I ask you. What is your experience of Jesus Christ that the world needs to know? It's not a question we can answer in a worship service on Saturday night or Sunday mornings. We have to find other ways to have these conversations. And some of us did. For eight weeks over the Lenten season, 
Some of us were involved in small groups. And throughout the rest of the year, some 200 of us are connected in small Christian communities where this kind of life can be discovered and experienced. What is this thing, fellowship? Fellowship comes from the Greek word koinonia. It means to share with, to hold in common, to participate with and experience with. And so God's people are held together as they share a common faith in Christ and participate in life out of that unity. It's what Jesus commanded us to do. To love God, to love one another, live in unity and harmony with each other and be unified. In the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus prays for his disciples and all of us that we may be one. This is so important that in the third chapter of this epistle, the author sums up the Christian life as believe in Jesus Christ and love one another, echoing Jesus' words. And in the fourth chapter, he says, no one's ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Fellowship roots and grows people in the life-giving message of Jesus. And what comes out of this is a joyful, life-filled, vibrant community. One of the most formative times in my ministry came after I returned to the United States, having had this experience of community and wanting it very much again, when I formed a women's group called Life Balance, and we met together over five years, and I hosted it in, in my home. And we had about 14 women that first year. And two of the women came to me at one point and talked to me about their challenges of raising children with significant learning disabilities. And I encouraged them that when they were ready, they might think about sharing that with the group, that we might support or pray for them. And on the Friday morning, when they did, we discovered that there were four other women in that group who had children with significant disabilities, not readily apparent to any of us. And then together, These women had shared experiences with one another. They had the faith, the understanding and compassion and empathy for one another's lives. They offered life-giving hope and encouragement for each other that was far beyond what I could give as the convener and facilitator of that group. And after that, this smaller group of women met to pray and support each other share resources, doctors' names and therapists and um, organizations that could help them, and just be with one another. But here's the thing. These women were not strangers to one another. They'd known each other for a long time. They'd sat in worship together next to each other for years, worked side by side in vacation Bible school, and yet had never had the opportunity to know this part of their lives. They'd even had coffee together in the fellowship hall during fellowship time. The point here is that fellowship is not just the times we worship and eat alongside and drink coffee together. It's also the time where we find those two or three people with whom we can share our careers, our health, our calling, our fears, our families, our hopes, and our joys. And so if you're part of Glenmar Church, come to church and drink some coffee, but also be willing to be in fellowship with others inside of here and outside in the community. One of the most meaningful relationships of your life might be with someone who's here in this room today seated near you. In a very clear way, I heard the pastor of a large church 
um, put it this way. If you come here to church services and sit down, yet never connect with others, in 12 to 18 months, we will be a disappointment to you. And so if that's something that you're hoping for and yearning for in terms of community, don't look now, but on your, the announcement page in your bulletin in the upper left-hand corner is an opportunity on April 29th to do just that. And so I extend that invitation to come and be with me and with others for one hour. Fellowship with Christ and one another changes how we live. How we live with each other and share our lives is a reflection of our life with God. How we relate in our, if you will, divine relationship, perhaps expressed vertically when we pray, and how we relate to one another horizontally when we pray is the full expression of life in Christian community. When we do those things together, there is a completeness and a fullness where people are in fellowship with God and with one another. And you know what happens when we're in relationship with God and each other and life gets tough and times get hard? Prayers go up. Meals get cooked. Children get cared for. Money is given. Tears are dried and hands are held. People walk and talk together and support one another. And so, in chapter 3, the author says, how does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And so I hope at Glenmar you find a group of friends who will love you, not just in word or speech, but in truth and action. Those that you can share your life and your faith with through the mountaintops and through the valleys, people who will celebrate when you get a promotion at work and those who will pray for you when you need a job. Those who will sit with you in the hospital and walk with you when you need to talk. The fourth chapter of Acts describes a community in the early church that did the, just that. And what they shared so completely and so generously with each other in the witnessing of their faith and the very practical sharing of their lives resulted in enough for everyone. I'd like to ask if there are those of you here who have been part of small group community at Glenmar in the recent year. Anyone? Oh, some. Okay. Great. So be willing to hear this question and think about putting your hand up again. If in your small group community you've had an experience of Jesus Christ that the world needs to know about, we have a small group that's like that? We've got some. Amen. Those of you who are looking for small group community, I hope you have noticed those who put their hand up. And those of you who raised your hand, I hope that maybe over a good cup of coffee after this service, if someone asks you, you'll be able to say a sentence or two about what you've experienced in your community of fellowship. I know as a result of what I experienced in Christian friendship and fellowship so many years ago, I have started and been part of groups with men and women in every church um, in which I've served. And my hope is always that there will be one person who has a good enough experience that they're willing to continue that also. Now, our scripture today challenges us to see how we're connected to each other in fellowship with God beyond a good cup of coffee. And so in this Easter season, we remember that we all stand in need of God's grace 
saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, who loves us and has given his life for us. And in this day, we celebrate um, a special way that Christ is with us in the sacrament of baptism and the reception of new members as the body of Christ here grows and roots one another in the life-giving message of Jesus Christ. And so we thank God for all that God is doing to increase our fellowship in strength and number. Amen. <laughs>